Hey team, Jack here. Today I'm going to take you through neutrophils and SARS-CoV-2. So make sure you watch my previous videos which give a good breakdown on neutrophils. And now we're going to jump into what role neutrophils play in SARS-CoV-2 pathology or COVID-19. So let's jump into it. Let's start right off the bat with this study, right? So neutrophils, uh, degranulation and netosis is activated by a cytokine called IL-8. And what it turns out is IL-8, the cytokine, is massively upregulated in COVID-19 patients. So here we have our healthy controls. Here we have SARS-CoV-2 patients. And we can see the IL-8 cytokine levels are massively upregulated. And actually, as a biomarker, it's exceptionally good. So this is a curve here. This is called a rock curve. Um, and basically, you can give a rock curve a score out of one on how good they are. Um, as a diagnostic test. And what we can see is that this out of one has a 0 0.967 score on how good they are at distinguishing between a healthy control patient and a SARS-CoV-2. So it's a good biomarker of the disease. And, and so, yeah, there's already a hint here that perhaps neutrophil activity is, um, neutrophil activity is definitely upregulated in SARS-CoV-2 patients. Now, what's interesting is also there are more studies that show that um, IL-8 and neutrophil activity also correlates with poorer outcomes in the patients. So not only do SARS-CoV-2 patients have higher levels of IL-8 and neutrophil activation, they also, um, it also, the higher the IL-8 and the higher the neutrophil activity is, the more likely they are to either die or have serious negative effects. Now, the... Um, if we go into the tissue and we look at MPO using immunohistochemistry, so that's the myeloperoxidase, which is a neutrophil um, enzyme found in their granules, which is um, bactericidal, fungicidal, and virucidal. It's a, it's a kill-all compound because it produces bleach. Um, so here we have some lung tissue here, and in the black we have the neutrophils because they're expressing MPO. So you can see a black cell here and a black cell here, and this is in the lung tissue. Here we have a brain section from a patient that's died from SARS-CoV-2, and we can see, again see these neutrophils inside the brain tissue. Now just to remind you, this is what a healthy lung looks like. You can see the alveoli spaces here, and there's no sort of neutrophilic response going on. And there's no bleeding going on. Um, and this is a healthy brain down here. And we can see, again, there's no bleeding or a neutrophilic response going on in a healthy brain. So these are very diseased. But correlation doesn't equal causation, right? It kind of makes sense that the patients with the worst infections would have the worst neutrophil response. So perhaps neutrophils are doing a good thing. And the reason why we're seeing this correlation between more neutrophils and worse outcomes is because the neutrophils are trying to contain a rampant infection. Correlation doesn't equal causation. Those neutrophils might be there for purely good reasons. But are they? So now we need to figure out, we need to do some animal experiments to look at causal relationships between neutrophil activity and SARS-CoV-2. And this is where things get interesting. Now, this is just a summary graph from this paper. Now, this is dealing with SARS-CoV-1, but it has very similar cell entry mechanisms. So what they basically found was as they increased, so they, on the cells, they put neutrophil elastase. They found that as they increased the neutrophil elastase co concentration, which is an enzyme, a protease enzyme produced by neutrophils, as they added more and more of this neutrophil elastase, the cell infection rate went up. So here's the actual graph here. Um, we've got the SARS infection rate here, and we've got the amount of elastase that I've added. So as they added neutrophil elastase, infection got worse. Why would that be? Well, the researchers looked into it and they found this interesting fact here. So this is how the virus fuses with the cell membrane. Um, it, it has a spike protein, which is broken up into the S1 domain and the S2 domain. And what happens is normally a cell protease on the surface of the cell cleaves off the S1 domain, which allows the S2 domain to shoot into the host cell membrane, insert its protein into the membrane, and then pull the membrane together to fuse the membrane of the virus in the cell. What they found was the neutrophil elastase does this process. It cleaves off the S1 subunit of the spike protein. 
So it is priming the virus to enter the cell. So perhaps neutrophil elastase makes things worse by allowing viral infections. But there's also, of course, this other factor that's going on, that neutrophil elastase and myeloperoxidase are non-specific. Neutrophil elastase digests host proteins, so your proteins, and myeloperoxidase produces bleach, which kills host cells as well as the virus. So you can imagine that as your neutrophilic response increases in your lungs, you're going to have more proteases digesting all the proteins, and you're going to be producing reactive oxygen species and bleach, which are going to be destroying your host cells. So inflammation can get rid of viruses, but it also kills a lot of your own tissue. There's also the problem that um, neutrophil elastase breaks down the barriers between endothelial cells in your blood vessels, allowing fluid to leak. This is part of the regular inflammatory response. Uh, endothelial cells do it too. Once activated, they naturally break their tight junctions between, uh, between themselves, causing fluid to rush into your lungs, which again doesn't help the situation. There's another factor that's going on, and people aren't really talking about this too much, but um, there was a surge of Kawasaki disease. Now, this is a blood vessel inflammation and clotting disease that normally happens in children. And when we don't normally associate it with SARS-CoV-2, with, with, with respiratory infections, but we are seeing it in SARS-CoV-2. SARS-CoV-2 is inducing Kawasaki disease in children, which creates these blood clots and inflammation on these small blood vessels like out in their fingers, on their skin, and on their tongue. They call it strawberry tongue disease, and you can kind of see why that is there. The other thing that we're seeing is more blood vessel effects of SARS-CoV-2 is um, strokes. We're seeing a massive increase in stroke. Um, and so here we have a little graph here, days from COVID-19 onset. And then we have um, uh, the line represents the days since uh, symptoms started the square white square represents hospitalization and the orange dot represents the ischemic stroke so in this study they found numerous patients that had this young patients that were otherwise healthy had this peculiar stroke um, that occurred out of nowhere and in fact in italy when sars cov 2 was breaking out which is where this paper came from they had to open up emergency neurological clinics to deal with the stroke influx now, when they did the logistic regression down here, they found that the odds of you having a stroke were eightfold higher if you had SARS-CoV-2 compared to the odds of having a stroke if you had influ influenza, which is a good comparison. So they're comparing a respiratory infection to a respiratory infection, and they found that you the odds were eightfold higher if you had SARS-CoV-2. So there's obviously this vascular component going on. This study, trying to get to the bottom of what's causing the vascular component of SARS-CoV-2. Now, there are a number of factors here. One of the big problems is that endothelial cells and blood vessels express ACE2. So the virus is getting into your blood cells. But neutrophils may play an important role in this. This study looked at heart attacks. So people with SARS-CoV-2 were also suffering heart attacks. And they took the clots out of the people that had the ischemic heart attack. So a blood vessel in their heart had clotted, they took those clots out and they used immunohistochemistry to probe what was going on in there. Um, in the blue, we've got DNA. In red, we've got myeloperoxidase. And in green, we've got histones. So histones are proteins wrapped up in the DNA. And we can see that all three of these images look nearly identical. And that's because there's a load of DNA throughout this clot. And this DNA is laced with myeloperoxidase and histones, which means that this is formed from netosis. So there is netosis going on in people's bloodstreams, and that may be causing problems. If we look at more research here, um, this research looked at, is this netosis that we're seeing in clots, is this DNA that's, that we see in clots, is it causing the clot? Right, and so uh, in green here we have um, we have a, a, a fluid flowing over neutrophils that have now released their nets, and then they've looked at where the platelets, which are what cause clots, has aggregated to that DNA. And what they found was, if you look at the similarity in these two patterns here, 
the platelets which cause clots in blood vessels were sticking to the neutrophil DNA that was being released through netosis. Here's an electron micrograph here and you can see clear as day these clots are full of DNA and the platelets are aggregating into the net. And it makes physical sense when you think about it. If you put a mini net inside your bloodstream, things are going to clot around it and it might cause issues. They then treated these clots with DNAs, an enzyme that digests up the DNA. And you can see that you immediately get rid of the nets. Here's the net, the presence of net here in green. You can see it disappears as soon as you put the DNAs on. Here's the clot, so the platelets. You can see the clot is forming over time. The platelets are binding to the DNA over time. And then we give this enzyme that digests up the DNA of the um, nets and the clot disappears. So uh, neutrophils, they're causing uh, damage to the host proteins um, through neutrophil elastase and through myeloperoxidase and bleach, right? Um, neutrophil activity is higher in patients that have worse symptoms. And um, there's a, a huge clotting and blood vessel component to SARS-CoV-2 and the neutrophil nets seem to be contributing to that. So the big question is, are neutrophils being friend or foe in SARS-CoV-2? Because let's not forget, the whole point of a neutrophil is to kill pathogens. So are they a friend or a foe? And this is what I would say is the rough literature conclusion. Now, obviously, we're still researching this massively, but I would say this is the conclusion from the literature. There is, as the disease severity goes up, the cost of neutrophil activation goes up and the benefit of neutrophil activation goes down. And at some point, this will cross, and eventually neutrophils are starting to do more damage than good in the really severe cases of the disease. But in the early cases of the disease, the virucidal activity of neutrophils will undoubtedly help prevent the virus spread, help maybe even prevent you get it, prevent that uh, initial infection going on. Um, and so I wouldn't recommend, obviously, uh, removing your neutrophils to protect yourself from SARS-CoV-2. We need it. Um, but there have now been several clinical trials that have used anti-inflammatories in late-stage SARS-CoV-2 and found it to be therapeutic. And one of the mechanisms will be inhibiting that new damaging neutrophil act activation in the late stages of the disease may be beneficial. Brilliant. So that was my summary of neutrophils and SARS-CoV-2.